This podcast is sponsored by Monarch Money. Have you been using Mint to manage your finances? Bad news, Mint shut down. The good news, there's a better alternative, Monarch Money. Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and loving it. Why? Because Monarch Money has built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive, insightful, ad-free, and prioritizes the user experience. Try it free for 30 days at monarchmoney.com slash podcast. With a comprehensive view of all your accounts, Monarch makes it easy to stick to your budgets and achieve your goals. Easily customize your dashboard, automate rules for transactions, and more. Monarch's built-in collaboration feature lets you invite your partner at no extra cost. Monarch makes it easy to switch from Mint, import your data, and keep all your tags and categories intact. See why the Wall Street Journal named Monarch Money the best budgeting app overall. Get a 30-day free trial today when you go to monarchmoney.com slash podcast. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H money dot com slash podcast for your free trial. Monarchmoney.com slash podcast. Cartoons were present in the past. Every week will be an animated bash. What a cartoon! What a cartoon! Maybe a short but mostly shops. We'll talk while we'll analyze, exploring as we go. What a cartoon! Hello, everybody, and welcome to What a Cartoon, the podcast that's more fun than hanging out with your grandma. I'm your host, the drunk on Supernatural Wine, Bob Mackey, and this is an audio exploration of every cartoon ever who is here with me today. Henry Gilbert, and I'm distracted by all these things you guys can't see right now. I'm real sure. And who was our special guest today? Hello, it's me, again, Sung Won Cho. Hooray! Hey. And today's episode is the Mushishi episode, The Green Seat. Ooh. Since the dawn of humanity... These phantoms have inspired fear in those who could not understand and have over the ages come to be known as Mushi. So yeah, Sung Won, you're back, and this is your choice for an anime. You want to do mm-hmm. a lot of uh, less uh, you know, famous anime, more obscure anime. You want to highlight VR podcast. Can you talk about why you wanted to uh, talk about Mushishi today on What a Cartoon? Mushishi has been one of my favorites for a very long time. Like, that came out, what, like 2005, I want to say? 2006? Oh, five. Yeah. Around that time, yeah. yeah. And I just remember when I watched it going, wow, there! this is an incredible, unique show. Like, it's a very quiet show. It's a very subtle show. And I think at the time I was, what, 14, 15, and I was like, wow, like, it's not all just, you know, <laughs> superheroes and whatever. It's like, oh, you can actually tell, like, really just subdued, uh, interesting, kind of spooky, kind of like slice of life kind of just haunting little stories with just great presentations. Yeah, so. and fun twists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're not cartoons, Mom, all right? Number one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Japanese animation. Sl- slam my door. Right. <laughs> Now, uh, yeah, this was, uh, I had never seen this show before. It's another one, like, I I stopped watching anime. I think I talked about this the last time around. But, yeah, I, I, I stopped watching anime probably right when you started watching anime. So mm-hmm. that was, like, just like with uh, Chihai Furu, this uh, is another one that, like, I just, I, it, it was in my latent period of anime watching. Yeah, I think uh, I think I did see this when it was new uh, via fan sub. Uh, so this is after I got out of college, just right right after that. My friends and I would still get together and watch anime, mm. and I believe we saw this and we liked it. But since we were all in our early twenties, we weren't like super psyched over it. There were things that were more violent or funny sure. or more action packed. And I will say, the opening song does not get you pumped to I, watch. A and yeah, I love that about it. It's uh, it's, it's a very so unique song, calm, and it's just like. Super Soothing nature images. And it's a just, fun, yeah. Uh, the second season is the same thing. They do um, uh, Shiver by, I forget the artist right now, but she's great. Um, it's just take a weird, just indie instrumental, not instrumental, but like soothing song track and then just play scenes of nature. And that really sets you up for what this show is. It's so, it's a hard sell because like if I try to explain to anyone what it is, it's like, well, okay. Uh, there, are, there are creatures called Mushi, and uh, they're uh, weird. I don't know. It's in Japan. It, it, nothing about it sounds interesting. It's definitely something you just kind of have to experience 
at least one episode and go, oh, that's the vibe of this show. Yeah, and in case our listeners want to know, uh, this is all available legally on YouTube for free. Oh, Funimation really? Funimation just put it up uh, 10 years ago, so the entire wow. dub is up and the entire sub is up, all 26 episodes. So you can stop the podcast now, watch the first mm-hmm. episode, it's 20 minutes long, and then come back to our podcast. But yeah, it's, it's all been up there for 10 years. I did not know that. I have it on a DVD, mm-hmm. so and, I, I just popped my old DVD back in. And all the manga is available uh, digitally. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. Kindle and Comixology, so... Uh, there are a number of ways to find this and experience it. Gotcha. It's, that's at least true in the U.S. Anyway, yes. I can't. Uh, if no, you're we're only talking our to our fellow region. Americans. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and if you're uh, if you're not American, you have to delete this podcast. It's illegal in your country. I yeah. feel bad even from our Canadian listeners who are just like when we say, "Oh, watch this on Hulu," and they're like, "Guys, <laughs> I, <can't do> <laughs> I know the pain. I go to Canada a lot. <laughs> Wait, so yeah. Hulu's not in Canada? No, no, no. no. Uh, Trudeau won't sign off on it. <laughs> What's his problem? It's weird that Disney Plus is able to steamroll into Canada and it can it plays there just fine but Hulu I'm not, not surprised so it is the rat the rat will do whatever he wants <laughs> I think by the time I move Hulu will be stripped bare of all content as everyone's just tearing things away from it and uh, making their own streaming networks right no that's where all the dirty stuff that uh, is too PG-13 or R for Disney Plus that's where it's gonna live on mm. there that's that's why I think Disney's turning Hulu into but mm. anyway enough about TV yes. network yeah. drama uh, <laughs> let's talk about Mushishi so uh, Sung one, you covered the history, or sorry, the premise a little bit, but the the premise is basically just a vehicle for all of these supernatural stories, often with an interesting twist at the end, where sure. uh, Mushi are these uh, very primitive, uh, primordial forms of life that only some people can see, and they cause uh, mischief and problems, and the protagonist of this series, basically, his mission is to go out and travel Japan, uh, the pre-Dutch uh, opening of Japan, so like still very isolationist right. Japan, it's his job to go out and research the Mushi and solve all the problems they're causing. And that's essentially the story. It's all episodic. It's just uh, very almost like sort of Twilight zone stories mm. about these supernatural creatures and what they're doing in this world. Yeah, uh, there are a couple like really solid like episodic anime with this similar vibe. Have you ever seen like Kino's Journey? Or oh, yeah, yeah. This actually yeah. reminds me a lot of that. Kino's no Journey. No talking motorcycle in this. In this right. <laughs> no talking motorcycle. But it has a very similar vibe to like Kino's Journey. Uh, I'm trying to think about it. Hainbei Ranmei, however you say that. The Angel. Hainbei Ranmei a little bit. The Angel bit. Show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That one was a little more connected. But this one, uh, from what I remember, it's been a while. Yeah, I think there are stories that are told throughout episodes. More than one episode right. in that one. Bushishi's interesting because, yeah, it is pretty much episodic. There is, um, if you keep watching, which I I always, whenever I bring a show mm-hmm. to you guys, I'm like, I hope you watch the whole thing one day. <laughs> this is my, it's my uh, it's so- s- selfish uh, self-interest to like, put this show out into your audience's like consciousness and get people to watch it. But um, there's like an interesting like stuff with, uh, they'll jump around in time sometimes. Uh, and then it's also very interesting that the anime kind of chose certain chapters and chose the order of how to hmm, do Okay, Because mm. from, from what I remember, uh, it's not following like how the manga exactly did it. Like there's, they kind of, decided which ones to choose from. Uh, and then it was interesting because for years, uh, I want to say off the top of my God, maybe like 10 years, there was like maybe like a 10 year gap between the first season and the second season. Yeah. First one was 2005 and the second one was 2014. 2014. Yeah. Right? And it was, I was dying for more Mushishi cause it's one of my, it's one of my top five anime of all time. Um, and they finally did like an OVA and like, or a couple OVAs. And then they finally did a second season where they covered every single story in the manga. So they mined completely everything in the manga then. Right. Wow, every, okay. I, from what I understand, everything at this point has been adapted. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, you know, yeah, for me watching it the first time, I watched like the first three episodes. Uh, everything, uh, my brain has been trained so much on like linear stories, mm. like in the things I binge and it's just... You know, it's it's from point A to point B. Right. It it felt like a real just kind of throwback to mm. to watch something that's so episodic. Like the things it was reminding me of were like watching like Columbo or Murder oh, She Wrote. Yeah. Or, yeah. or also that's kind of the feel of the Mandalorian now. Honestly, it seems oh, like okay. he just kind of goes from town to town. Or the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, yeah. All those all those old shows before the binge culture came in and everything was like linear. I think. Like, if things are prestige now, if they're linear, it's uh, like, so, so I think episodic stuff maybe isn't as respected these days, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, this is, uh, it feels like such a great, like, throwback to those kind of things, especially, like, 
Ginko uh, really comes off to me like a quirky detective who mm. comes to town and solves yeah. a mystery. You're right. I thought this felt like a detective show when I was watching it, for sure. Mm. Uh, I, I guess he's more of like an exterminator, though. Yeah, like, part uh, Ghostbuster, <laughs> part detective. But I guess the Ghostbusters were detectives in their own right. But I want to talk about the manga really quick. So this came from a manga. Uh, so this manga began as a one-shot in 1999, and it was serialized in two uh, different sign-in anthology manga anthology book so sign in is uh, basically the japanese word for adult manga mm-hmm. so when i believe uh, chihaya furu was the female version of sign in whatever yeah, jose right there you go yeah, yeah jose yeah. so this is the i guess male version although it seems like pretty for anybody really yeah. it doesn't seem very gendered to me but yeah so it ran in two different anthologies from 1999 or sorry from 2002 to 2008 and it spread across 10 volumes and as you said someone uh there were two anime series uh, two tv specials a live action movie and an animated movie have you seen the live action movie i'm just I curious have not because they're all always bad yeah They're, they can't be good they're always bad yeah uh something about japanese cinema with anim translating anime to screen it's always so cheesy and so over the top not that anime isn't but it, it's not <laughs> an, even like a good way now i have not seen the live action mushishi movie so it could be great mm. i have no idea I, I had friends tell me to try the Jojo Part 4 movie, just because they're like, ah, it's cheesy, but fun. Didn't Takashi Miike make that? Uh, hmm, I think he might have. I yeah. think that was him. Hmm. Oh, wait, no, uh, this is a video game adaptation. I was going to say, I did like the Ace Attorney movie. <laughs> There's also Takashi Miike, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I believe. I don't know if that makes me want to watch it more or less, knowing he did it. <laughs> <laughs> I, he, Any movie where I know he made it, I'm like, that makes me more interested to watch uh, this. <laughs> so yeah, the uh, the manga author is uh, Yuki Urushibara, a female manga author, born in 1975. Uh, started with a male pen name, of course. So she hasn't published that much. I think Mushishi is her longest running work. So mm. uh, she started in uh, 1997 with uh, her first work was called Bioluminescence. It's just an anthology of works uh, published elsewhere. There's not a lot of research on her on the English speaking or English language internet that I could find really outside of just like a bibliography. So there were two uh, basically compilations of her previous work before Mushishi. Uh, so that was a uh, bioluminescence and then uh, filaments. So mm. these two like short story co- uh, collections. Um, there's also something called Water she worked on, which I believe is collected in two volumes. Uh, and everything but Mushishi has basically been scanlated. If you want to check it out, uh, there's no English release. But uh, this Water series, the uh, the synopsis is in the midst of a blazing hot summer, beset by water shortages. Middle school girl Chinami faints from heat exhaustion. Upon waking up, she finds herself in a mysterious town by a beautifully pristine river whose waters hide many secrets. So mm. another sort of supernatural uh, mystery story. And that's the same thing with her most recent manga, which is called uh, Translated Cats Are Facing West. It's about essentially a supernatural detective just like Ginkgo and Mushishi. And uh, they're assigned to take care of these things called uh, flow, which are irregularities in reality. Mm. And they have a cat with them that can detect these irregularities and mm. hopefully put an end to them. So Cats Are Facing West seems like a modern day version of Mushishi based on what I've read about the premise. So okay. those are all of her works today. That sounds pretty cool. I think yeah. I'd like to check out that manga. It's probably, is that one been localized? Have you heard or if not? It seems like a scanlation. Yeah, not job, officially. But... I don't know anyone, but Shonen Jump that brings over just chapters of manga mm. chapters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that Shonen Jump is probably the main one. Yeah. Do that kind of thing. So yeah, these are published in a much smaller manga that doesn't really bring over anything. I think they, people just license things from them and, bring them over so i'm pretty sure mushishi is the only thing of hers that has been brought here and again you can get that on a kindle and comiXology it's very very available but the anime is like tap water you can just turn on your youtube and it's there waiting for you <laughs> nice. for free yes uh yeah. so let's talk about the anime so the anime um directed and written uh, or adapted rather by hiroshi nagahama uh this is a very interesting guy he joined madhouse as a mechanical designer for the ova that's called cockpit which is a 1993 adaptation of Leiji Matsumoto's manga Battlefield, which is a World War II manga from the perspective of uh, Japanese soldiers. Mm. Mm. And that that was brought over here, but it was highly criticized because it was a positive portrayal of the Axis forces. But I understand why. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I didn't know that was in Matsumoto's past. Yeah. I, it's I'd not only... sci-fi at all. I was yeah. like, is this sci-fi Battlefield? But no, it's not. I've only heard of his sci-fi things. Huh. Okay. <laughs> so his first role as 
as a series director right before Mushishi was with Madhouse. It was the uh, second Jubei Chan series, and I love Jubei Chan. It's a oh, very fun yeah. comedic action series with very very good action, despite how comedy focused it is. Mm. Um, so after I, well, okay, oh. I'm sorry. I'm, okay. su- I'm surprised to. Or I guess I'm not surprised to hear he's from Madhouse because at first I thought this was a Madhouse series uh, when I saw the opening. Like it has, it it has a real Madhouse feel to me, though. Uh, the it the budget does feel a little lower than, uh, than say like a typical Madhouse thing, like One Punch Man. But, that is true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yes, after Mushishi, he directed uh, Detroit Metal City, The Flowers of Evil, uh, the second Mushishi anime series and TV specials. And most recently was chosen to direct the much-anticipated anime adaptation of Uzumaki, which is coming to Adult Swim. Nice. I knew about this. Yeah. Yeah. It made me very excited. This is the guy, I think Junji Ito, the author of Uzumaki, had a hand in this, but I just remember him uh, reading him being very happy about this director being chosen and being chosen because of Mushishi. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I am so excited for that. Uh, That's what the... Uh, composer of Hereditary, right? Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, and the director of Mushishi, and I think there was like one other thing that made me excited. But there have been no good Junji Ito anime adaptations. I've heard that uh, recent anthology series. All I've read about it and watched about it was that it wasn't good and not worth investing in. The uh, I always hear they're just like you know, go read it. Yeah, <laughs> like it's beautifully drawn. Why are you watching it? Go read it. Yeah, like here's a, here's somebody that copied a very disgusting picture that you could just look at on a page instead of you know watching it in color. Right. Well, I, I mean, the detail in a, just one panel from Junji Ito is so so intricate and intense. Like the pencil mileage of drawing that for a, a scene in an anime, like that seems very difficult. So mm, yeah. yeah, I don't. I feel bad for anybody who has to adapt it. But uh, yeah, that trailer. The trailer for Uzumaki they put out a few months back. Yeah, that great. was really good. Looking yeah, and out. four episodes seems perfect for that series. I mm-hmm. think they can just cover it all without stretching anything out or you know making the pacing weird or stretch out the budget across too many episodes. Yeah, sure. too. Yeah. yeah, hopefully get the budget they need. But one thing I discovered about this director uh, in 2017 was the co-creator with Stan Lee. Yes, that's Stan Lee. Mm. The co-creator of uh, The Reflection, an anime superhero series that he was a co-director on. Has anyone heard about oh, this? The no. Reflection. The Reflection? <laughs> yeah. No. I, I knew never. about... What did, what did Stan Lee do? The, like Hero Man or whatever? There was some mm. other like shonen manga he was involved with, in, mm. quote unquote. Yeah. But I don't know the reflection. I, I want to say at this point in his life, I, I want to say Stan Lee was just sort of rubber stamping things or his oh, family yeah. was for him. I don't know if he yeah. had the mental capacity to be a showrunner right. on an anime. Yeah, I doubt he even knew that happened. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, no, I, as the, I'm wearing the Spider Man shirt in here, so I should know this, but I, yeah, he, Stanley basically set up like Stanley Enterprises for his family, and just he became a producer on things, mainly just sell. I, to me, it felt like he was mainly just selling his name as you can say Stanley presents this right. on your show. I, I mean, maybe he had more of a creative hand in it. I, uh, there was this takes me back to a funny video I watched recently, right after. Uh, Stanley passed away. I was watching uh, the Toei 70 Spider Man stuff mm. and I was like, man, I wonder did anybody ever ask Stan Lee about this ever? And then I found on YouTube uh, it was a DVD extra from the Japanese only release of the DVD series of just they were able to sit down with Stan and ask him about the show. Mm. And he had like very little memories from it, which seemed like he just said, like, yes, you should make this. Yeah. And they were like, oh, well, here, let's show you the opening. And uh, what do you have thoughts on it? And he played for like a minute. And he's like, that's very nice. Thank you. And then he like closed the window. <laughs> that's enough of that. Yeah. So this was animated by the studio Artland, which seemingly is defunct, but it was founded Aww. in 1978. Uh, so it's kind of confusing in my research because um, Artland was one animation studio, but in 2010, I think the Salvage It uh, was split into two different companies. One was Artland Incorporated, which handled licensing, mm. and the other one was Animation Studio Artland Incorporated, which handled uh, animation. Oh, so okay. uh, it was in trouble, and uh, we all know how precarious anime production can be just sure. in how much we're talking about animation. They don't make any money. Um, studios are closing all the time. It's a very cutthroat world until like streaming came along and helped a lot of them out. But even that didn't help wages very much. Right, right. Man, that's uh, this is like I'm finding out somebody died after I just <laughs> discovered them. I don't think I've seen an Artland series before this one. 
I, I don't know the name what, of it. Uh, what are some art lands? Um, there's a bunch of stuff. A lot of it is obscure, but they kind of started in the uh, the late 70s, early 80s with stuff like uh, Super Dimension, Fortress Macross, oh, okay. and oh. Legend of Galactic Heroes. So Ouch. they were yeah, one of that's one right. of like three different production people working on that. Yeah, uh, with like Topcraft, uh, Henry Wright. Yeah, yeah. I, I normally I associate Macross with Topcraft first, but yeah, they that's right. And Studio New, but they're they're also in their art land. That's right. Mm. Uh, no, the uh, the Legend of Galactic Heroes. That's another one. I uh, I watched your video recently of your top five before two thousand. Sure. Uh, because I I watched your one with this one uh, with Mushishi listed Mushishi listed in it, and I was like, I'm old. I don't know any of these shows. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I wanted to see your ones from before two thousand and. Uh, at the end, you're like Legend Galactic Heroes. Like, oh god, I gotta watch it. It's finally available in the U.S. It's like, amazing. I, is there a Blu-ray now, or is it streaming somewhere? There's a uh, there's a limited edition. Oh god, <laughs> disgustingly expensive giant box of the entire thing. Wow, and I have it. How many episodes? <laughs> Uh, it's like a hundred, hundred right? some, hundred some. Wow, wow. There's a hundred some OVA, or it's an OVA, and then there's like the movie. And then there's a separate guidance series that's like side stories, and I've seen all of it. That's the wildest thing to me that it was an OV, like it wasn't yeah. broadcast. It, oh yeah, is that why it looks so good? Episodes of OVA, that's insane. You could buy a mansion with the amount that would cost in uh, whenever it came out. <laughs> Listen, that's another. Sh- that's a show I could do a whole podcast on, but it's such a hard sell. A lot of my, f- I think I talked about this last time I was on, but a lot of my favorite <laughs> anime are such <laughs> hard sells. It's a space. Epic about just the, 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 the political treachery and like the the normy way I try to pitch it is like it's like space Game of Thrones but I don't like Game of Thrones but it's, <laughs> but it's like what you want out of you just a, a gotta Game of say Thrones. Game of Thrones yeah space yeah. Game of Thrones and the, what people expect of that sort of intrigue and that kind of thing no dragons or coffee cups or anything no like that. Good. <laughs> right excellent uh, yeah. I I saw it's like on Verve and High Dive too like streaming mm, it's, yeah uh, so that's uh, man I gotta watch that uh, I I you also had Maison and Koku on there which is like oh that's yeah that's that's a tough one for me to sell on people. Also, mm. because that is very not available right now. Nope. I think uh, some enterprising... It, at times, I've seen subbed ones just uploaded to YouTube that have not been taken down yet, but mm. just uh, otherwise... Like, yeah. Kimaguri Orange Road is the Pepsi to the to the Maison Koku Coke. <laughs> uh, I guess, yeah, yeah, that's a good... That's a, uh, the Maison Koku, it's, it's about college-age people in their 20s mm. having... Uh, more mature adventures. Chased, yeah. chased fun. <laughs> it's not as sexy as like uh, an Inuyasha or a Ranma for the kids, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. It's like adult age, like real people just having relationships and that sort of thing. And I like seeing all the, the well-realized like 80s Tokyo too that they just walk yeah. around and like all the 80s stuff they see. But sorry, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, more on Art Artland. Uh, well, they did all the Mushishi stuff. So the TV specials mm. and the two seasons. Uh, it's been functionally closed since July of 2017. No oh. updates on this yet, but the president of the company has assured the world it's not closed. <laughs> they're only seeking help with restructuring, so don't mm. worry. But uh, I think it's just over. I think they're just like a licensing company now or gotcha. maybe just selling off old uh, materials and cells and things like that. Who knows? That's like the guy next president saying, like, we're definitely doing Royal Space Force, too. That's totally happening. We're, they've been hard at work on that for like three years now or something. But yeah. That's not. That's He's saying not that as the wrecking ball comes down behind him and destroys the building. <laughs> uh, and the last, the last creative I have on here is uh, the music, which is very nice. It's mm. by uh, Toshio Masuda. So he is the composer for, for Naruto. Naruto, yeah. yeah. So his like very traditional Japanese music, for lack of a better word, definitely fits in with the style of this series. And it's interesting, too, because I love Bushishi soundtrack, and it's very subtle. Because have you watched Naruto? Oh, yeah. I've watched about 100 of the early episodes. <laughs> that's not a subtle soundtrack. No, no. By any means. I think there's one track that's seriously called like Sadness and Sorrow, and it's the <laughs> most like... <laughs> It's so over the top. I can hear the synth violins right now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Mushishi feels so. It. I mean, I can tell that it's him, and yet it feels so like subdued. Like, take it back. Take it back. Like, just mm-hmm. let let the scene breathe. Yeah, a he's, bit. he seems very uh, varied in his talents and skills because uh, this is a very subtle, uh, uh, moody soundtrack. But he also had, did the soundtrack for Excel Saga, oh. which is the <laughs> shrillest, loudest, yeah. most synthy <laughs> soundtrack ever. Go back to our what a cartoon. 
about Excel Saga to hear some of that. But uh, yeah, and he also composed for the two Jubei Chan series, another a series with very traditional Japanese music. So he is the dude doing the music for Mushishi. I I love the music in the episodes I watch because like it does it doesn't tell you what to feel so much or so like loudly. Like there's sure. it, like in this episode there's. There's scenes that, you know, are threatening or creepy or whatever, and there's definitely a soundtrack to it that kind of, but it plays it so low key. I, mm. I really like that. Like it it shows kind of a trust in the viewer to like you, you, if the visuals are doing their job, the soundtrack doesn't need to shove it in your face what thematically is happening there. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of scenes that actually have no music and it's yeah. just like nature. Nature mm. ambiance, just the trees rustling. I love that about it. Yeah, even the cicadas in this are kind of quiet. Like I, <laughs> I, I'm used to Evangelion screaming cicadas. So. So it's nice to get a break from those. But yeah, that's <laughs> essentially the history. I mean, it's a fairly straightforward history. The author hasn't done too much outside of this. There's no scandal, like plagiarism scandal with like the uh, Chihaya Furu oh, yeah. author. So it's all very straightforward. Anything final we want to add to this before we move on to the episode discussion? Um, oh, I, I really love the Japanese voice cast on okay. it. Like, I mm. think... Uh, and direction wise, they're they do feel like they're not playing it in the normal voiceover tone of mm. like you know cheery or peppy or or uh, just shouting things For like sure. everybody just kind of just like breathes out like if if there's drama or emotions to express they definitely do that but uh, especially with the lead character. Uh, Ginkgo, like, it's just so, like, chill. It's just like, ah. I love Ginkgo's voice, <laughs> Japanese voice actor. He mm. doesn't do a lot of anime, from what I know. Yeah, right? this is, a, like, an early role for him uh, in terms of I voice acting. I think in my point, he's only very, very I mean, maybe I'm misremembering, but he mm. hasn't done, I don't remember him doing a ton. Like, he, he does anime, but it's, his delivery is so chill. Like, it's just very straight, like, matter of fact. It's like, yeah, you know, Mushi exists, and it's, that, <laughs> that's that. Like, it, it's that kind of cadence almost. And that's not something you're kind of used to with something with such a supernatural sort of show. Yeah. Like, you expect sort of like screaming or, you know, uh, loud reactions to things. Like, the first episode, there's what? There's like three characters, basically. Yeah. And two of them are kids, essentially, and they're just very subdued performances i I really love um like you said that it's not like the typical super animated performances Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like well and so many of the scenes are just like hushed tones in a Mm. side room of like what what are you talking about right yeah Yeah. i listened to the uh the dub for this one and it took me a while to get used to how low-key the actor is even the dub actor is is following that tone very well and I do like that, how that applies to the character, where the character does try to play it very, very cool, but he is a huge nerd about mm-hmm. Mushi, yeah. and he gets excited <laughs> about learning new things about them, but he tries to play it off very cool. Right. <laughs> uh, just talking about Ginkgo in general, I love this protagonist because he is not... You, you mentioned, like, Exterminator before, but I think that's not true. He's definitely just, like, an observer mm. and appreciator of Mushi. He helps people... But at the same time, he makes sure to like emphasize to people that Mushi are not villainous. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. just things that exist, and sometimes they fuck people over, and sometimes they do just weird shit. Um, but he's just like, they, they also exist, and they have a right mm-hmm. to exist, and we just have to try to coexist with them. So if Egon did not join the Ghostbusters and just mm-hmm. studied ghosts, then be <laughs> just, it was like, ghosts are great. Independent yeah. ghost detective. Yeah. No, no, yeah, that is true. Yeah, I, he doesn't... Uh, if if um, Mushi dies under his watch, like he's not actively trying to kill it, or mm-hmm. it's just, it's more part of like the... The circle of life kind of stuff. He's not like, uh, he's definitely not like a deal gribble type, that's for sure, <laughs> in, in what a killer he is. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, yeah, it's uh, maybe it's more like, say, Jane Goodall or something. The yeah. He's trying to live with Live them. amongst yeah. the Mushi. Right. Mm. So that is it for the history of Mushi Shi. We'll come back and talk about the first episode, The Green Seat. single 
step of the way I pay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the break for Mushishi. I am one of your hosts for this one, Bob Mackey. I have one eye covered because I'm emo, <laughs> who is here with me right now. Uh, hey, it's Henry Gilbert, and I've taken up smoking just to scare away the Mushishi. <laughs> That's a good excuse. So we're back in the lovely uh, Gilbert Manor recording this break. We <laughs> want to thank our great guest, Someone Cho, for being on another episode of What a Cartoon. Uh, so and happy please, to have him back. And please check out all of his stuff all over the internet. But as for us, if you want to check out our stuff, more of it, and also help the show, please go to patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And for the low price of just five bucks a month, you can get all of our episodes one week ahead of time in ad free. And you'll also get access to everything behind the $5 paywall. That includes all of our mini series like uh, Talking Critic, Talking Futurama, Talking of the Hill, and Talking Futurama Season 2 Part 1, which just wrapped up. That's a lot of episodes right there, but that's not all. We also have lots of podcasts behind the $5 paywall, like a monthly community podcast, end of season wrap-ups, lots and lots of interviews, delete scene specials, and so much more. There's over 100 bonus podcasts just waiting for you if you've never been part of the Patreon. We've done so much for the Patreon only in the past two and a half years and much more stuff to come. And Henry can tell everyone out there, what is happening at the $10 level at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Extra long podcasts every month that are voted on by patrons. Yes, if you would like to hear a What a Cartoon podcast that is sometimes even four times longer than uh, ones like this episode, you need to sign up at the $10 level for the What a Cartoon movie podcast. If you're a $10 subscriber at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons, you get all those $5 benefits plus our monthly podcast where we talk about a different animated feature film, sometimes for over four hours. Our most recent one is The Iron Giant. We talked about that Brad Bird classic. Previous ones, we've done Toy Story, Cowboy Bebop the Movie, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Aladdin, the 1992 version, of course, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Kiki's Delivery Service, Akira, Batman Mask of the Phantasm, A Goofy Movie, Tiny Toons, How I Spent My Vacation, and at least one other I'm forgetting there, Rocco's Modern Life Static Cling, that's the other one. You can hear all of those over 40 hours of amazing podcasts that are only for our $10 and up patrons at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. So please head up to the premium level today. And if you're new to Patreon, it's so easy to sign up. And once you do sign up, you're given a special code. You have access to that code at all times. What you do with that code is you just drop it into whatever you use to listen to the podcast and you will be able to download our bonus podcast alongside of all of our free podcasts and any other free podcast you listen to. And there's also a very nice Patreon app that lets you do the exact same thing all in one app. Either way, it's so easy to listen to all of our bonus stuff. Super, super easy. That's it for our break. Thanks for listening to it. We'll let you get back to more spooky fun with Mushishi. back to talk about the first episode of Mushishi, The Green Seat. I prefer the uh, translation The Green Throne because when I hear The Green Seat, I think about a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem a lot more like basic and yeah. normal instead of like uh, the Green Throne feels more like the kind of uh, pomp and circumstance of the ceremony we see later in the episode. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's true. And so uh, you guys have seen more of the show than me. Does the, every episode open with this prologue? Like this is what Mushi are... And then it just kind of cruises into the opening song. A lot of them do. Okay. Uh, and then it's an interesting thing. There's like, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a reason why the narrator is that narrator. Okay, and cool. It's like there's, so there's always like, there's like little bits of payoff you get as you watch it. Um, but yeah, there's not every episode from what I remember. It's been a while since I've last rewatched it, but um, that is sort of a recurring thing is that. She definitely is at the end of each episode, from what I remember, like to 
uh, introduce the next episode. Okay. Yeah. And we already talked about the opening song a little. We could talk about it more now in the opening. I was watching this and listening to, and I totally forgot about this. And what caught me off guard was the, uh, the title of this opening, the sore feet song. And I was like, oh, what? what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is by the Scottish singer songwriter, Ali Kerr or Kerr. And, uh, this is not a, uh, a very Japanese choice for an extremely Japanese show, which mm. I like. It's very, uh, off the tone and interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm. Just like a, a Scottish man singing to you in English. <laughs> it kind of fits Ginko's look. Ginko has a very Western look mm. to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, the clothes that he wears are not traditional. Everyone he meets are always wearing, you know, very traditional Japanese clothing for the time period. And he looks out of place. I mean, his design is also... Uh, and there's a reason why he looks like that. That's something that also goes mm. is something later okay. in the show. But like he he just looks like an oddity. Like he's got that white hair, green eyes, and then just a Western style clothes. And I think I think the opening kind of fits him in that weird way. Mm. It feels like Ginko uh, is this out of place Western, not Western, but like he feels out of place in that sense as he's journeying about Japan. Mm. Well, yeah, and the character is so like uh, outside society. He mm. doesn't like stick around anywhere. Plus, uh, yeah, and the, the statement of like I walked. Uh, the the song is all about walking a ton, which sure. is what Ginko does That's quite a lot. That's all he does yeah. in the show. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and yeah, that I I looked up a blog post about this song that Ali did, like uh, explaining it because he said like this was like a blog he did like the, in this decade, uh, mm. and he was just saying like, oh, I got all these. Uh, messages on YouTube about this song. I guess I have new fandom, so here I'll just tell you. And yeah, he's like a he put out this album like in the two in the early two thousands, and then uh, Japanese producer just reached out to him, and said, "Hey, we want to use that song." And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not unheard of to hear um, a licensed English song used in an opening or ending in an anime, but it's still not it's not too common either sure, uh, sure. yeah and like in 2005 is probably a lot more rare i mm-hmm. think right uh, yeah so it, it it really strikes you in the beginning too and that the opening animation too like it breaks all the rules of what you expect from like an anime op you don't see a character like yeah. it's not fast paced there's no kick-ass action scene with the yeah. entire ensemble <laughs> yeah yeah i, I mean, understand why though, of course <laughs> If I was a television network exec, I'd be like, how people are going to change the channel the second they see this. They're not going to watch this show. When I was a teenager, when I first saw the opening, I was like, this is so boring. (laughs) So I totally, and now my reaction is so the opposite. Like, I love that it's so weird. It's so out of the ordinary. My brain is aging to the point where it's ready for Mushishi Exactly. Yeah, Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, we start with uh, basically some shots of the, uh, the forest greenery. And Ginkgo, so my problem with writing Ginkgo so much is every time I wrote it, I first wrote Genki, which is the exact opposite of who Ginkgo is. Like, <laughs> yeah. he's not a bright, energetic character, but I know Genki. I don't know Ginkgo. So that was my mental block throughout this episode. So I'm sorry if I say Genki at any point. Mm-hmm. But yes, uh, he's walking through the greenery. Um, we hear over the establishing shots of this forest that uh, someone's coming, someone's strange. So something is detecting Ginko as he walks through this forest. Something is darting through the trees, too. Uh, we can see the, the branches sag a little bit as he's walking through the forest. And we, the viewer, we don't really see what it is, but Ginko thinks it might be a monkey. Mm. You do see like a flash of like a flowered yukata, uh, yeah. which, well, after, when you watch it a second time, then you know exactly what that is. Mm-hmm. But also, as like an introduction to your protagonist of the show, it's a really cool thing to just have like say, something's coming, like just explaining that a cool guy is coming. <laughs> like, look, this is exciting, right? Like, right. Yeah. I think this is like the adaptation of the first chapter, too, right? Like, mm. this, they didn't go out of order, at least for the first episode. I, 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 I believe, believe so. Oh, yeah. So uh, Ginko picks up as the narrator who talks about how, like, once in every while, someone is born with the power to create life. And he's setting up the character of uh, Shinra. Mm-hmm. And we can see a bit of that in this uh, little scene with him where he's uh, writing characters down. But the kanji he's written down uh, tear themselves off the page. And he's like, oh, these are pictographs. So even these are representing living things. And I checked with a resident Japanese knower, Nina Matsumoto. <laughs> he drew the kanji for bird and it tears itself off the page and becomes a bird and oh, flies around. Oh, which so, I love. Yeah. 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 I, and good on the localizers too, on the, on the subtitle version, they're like, Oh, well, these Chinese characters that are pictograms. I was like, Oh yeah. Like uh, you, like that reminded me, if you're not a native speaker, you don't maybe know the history of kanji or the sure. kanji to an outsider just looks so 
complicated. It's, it is where my brain stopped in basic Japanese learning. I was like, I can't remember these things. But uh, yeah, they, they're, they are meant to be pictograms in a lot of cases. Like, of like, oh, that's a tree or that's a ship or the, yeah, yeah. So clever, um, clever use of uh, his powers coming out there. Right. And I love that um, it just sort of immediately hits you with, this is the kind of show you're watching. You're, mm. This is the, the show you're watching is one where characters and ink can just fly off of a page. Mm. Like I had forgotten how quickly they just went, this is what, this is, it's a supernatural show. Here it is. Uh, and it has an impact. Like you know, watching things f- sort of fly off of the page mm. makes you go, oh, fuck. Okay, <laughs> let's let's see what happens with this. Yeah, yeah. it seems like there are limitless, limitless possibilities for what the uh, the Mushi can do yeah. and how uh, what you can see in this show. If you're already seeing like words flying off the page, what will happen over the next 26 episodes? Some wild shit. <laughs> let me tell you that. Oh, man. In the uh, the I in the episodes I watched too, uh, it, like in this one, there's good use of CGI, like within their capabilities. Like on a TV budget, uh, you know, for so many shows, like CGI can only go so far. Sure. Like I remember on uh, even the Agents of Shield show, like oh, Ghost Riders in this show this season, and like they could afford like forty seconds of Ghost Riders head sure. pretty much. Sure. And uh, but in this case, like they. Just, you know, these letters coming alive, like it's it works so well. And it's like such a kind of even by 2005 CGI standards, like a simple trick. Like it's just a 2D image yeah. floating away. They keep but, it very limited. So it yeah. looks effective. But yeah, so this is how uh, Ginko meets up with uh, Shinra where he's he's walking to his place and the letter flies out and he grabs it. He turns the ink in his hand mm. and uh, he is on his way to see him. Like he knows where he's going. He sent a letter in advance. He's like, there's some mushy stuff happening here and I have to investigate it. I really need to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I think later we find out like he's not there to see um, Shinra. He's there for Shinra's grandmother, the actual thing that's happening in the house. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, also I like that he's not, it shows you Ginko is like slightly, he's like, Oh, huh. that's mm-hmm. weird. But not like, Freaking like, out! Oh, my head. Yeah, yeah. What's Ginko has seen plenty of shit, so he's like, yeah. oh, ink flying at me." Okay, probably <laughs> a mushy thing. And he's already narrating as if he is like, "I am the authority on all things in this world." Like, trust me. Here's another story I can tell you. Mm-hmm. Well, and I like to Ginko a lot of his adventures. He has that I. It seems like he often has to explain like, uh, well. Other people wouldn't understand this. This would actually be really bad if this got caught. So I'll <laughs> I'll help. Like he's this understanding person in this uh, world where people would jump to a lot of conclusions if they saw you magically create life with sure. a, uh, with writing. Yeah, I also like the just the how slow even dramatic things happen. Like at the the very first shot with Shinra, like taking the bandage off his hand and like unfolding his left hand. Like mm. it, it moves like just so gradual and mm. it lets you feel it takes its time the impact. Yeah. yeah. It sets up a mystery. Like why was his hand bound? Who did this? And we mm. see that a little bit of that later, but uh, yeah, it turns out that a lot of people come by because of the rumors they're hearing about this child, this magical child, but he does turn all of them away, but there's something about uh, Ginko Shinra is a lot more welcoming to him than he would be for any other stranger. Mm hmm. I was actually just writing you a reply. You're not the first person who's come here hoping to study me. But like I told them, I'm afraid I have to turn you away. It was my grandmother's final wish. She wanted to keep others from learning about my gift. She told me I should try to avoid using it as much as possible. I guess you've already seen for yourself. If I draw a picture of something, it comes alive. Even if it's not a picture of a living thing. See... My grandmother felt it was somehow wrong that a person should be able to create new forms of life out of thin air. That was work best left to the gods, she always said. And she absolutely forbade me from drawing anything with my left hand. Oh, if I draw with my right hand, nothing happens. Just my left. But unfortunately, I hurt my finger the other day, so... You were riding left-handed when the creature I saw got away from you? Yeah, it was an accident. I was completely surprised when it started moving. I don't know why, really. I've had stranger things come to life on me. Really? Such as? Mm, An umbrella, a back scratcher. (laughs) But I shouldn't be telling you this. (laughs) I like, too, that uh, their conversation, like, keeps going. And then it's, like, the only, like, straight-up, like, comedy beats in the episode is when... 
Shinra realizes he's being like interviewed by yeah. King Cody. He's like, "Hey, stop it!" Like, uh, and then he has a little tsh, like yeah. to the to the camera. Yeah, yeah. he even has like the. But the the type of like facial acting they mostly don't do in the show, just like they draw a comedy face yeah. on him, yeah, like, a, like big an extreme eyes. reaction. Yeah. yeah, and he's explaining that uh, he normally draws with his right hand because when he draws with his left hand, that's when he creates life. But has he injured his right hand, mm. so he's basically seeing what he can do now. This is about the wickedness of the left handed. That's, that's <laughs> what they should be punished. Yeah, but, uh, we but, need more messaging about that in our, uh, in our media. It's the wicked hand. That's uh, that's what the Bible taught us. The sinister hand. Yeah, the sinister hand. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so obviously Shinra is pretty lonely. So Ginkgo is invited to stay the night, and from this we learn that Shinra has been alone here for four years uh, after his grandmother died. But he vowed to his grandmother to stay there forever. That's amazing that he yeah. has like lived and eaten and Makes taken delicious care of wine. himself. Yeah. Oh man, fermenting his wine. <laughs> and just gets wine. fucked up on wine every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's like a little Orson Welles. Uh, I guess there wasn't like uh, uh, drinking age laws at the time then. I it's suppose. probably safer to drink than pond water. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I also, man, another just like great drawing is the... Um, the little flashback where he shows how he could make things come alive, even things that don't exist. Mm. And the way that, like, giant, like, monster is the hovering over monster. him. Oh, yeah. yeah. So good. Yeah, though he... It, uh, another show, like, a less... Um, in less subtle hands, I think it would have just been, like, more about the creepiness of it, or they played, like, some more shocking noise. Like, Wah! Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, like l- there are later episodes of Mushishi that definitely almost go into just straight up horror. Um, mm. but I like that this one has just little droplets of it, like little, like, Oh, that's a little, gives you the ghiblies a little bit. It's like, <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a little ink monster that is very kind of unsettling, but it doesn't dwell on it too long. So it, the, yeah. sh- the show kind of eases you into the horror of, uh, oh, yeah, there's some straight up just very terrifying stuff later mm. but there it's great that's why the show is so great because some episodes are super sweet and super whimsical some of them are super horrifying some mm. of them are super sad it it goes all over the place um emotion wise so like uh, ginkgo shinra can see the mushi as well and he's describing uh, you know i can see the mushi sometimes and i drew pictures of them and i tried to make my grandma believe me but she says you're just seeing things to the point where even he thought he was so mm. he didn't have a fellow mushi friend mm. and his grandmother <laughs> in her old age i i like how they're uh, like i don't know smurfs or ants or whatever just marching around him or just all <laughs> floating around uh, yeah they and the designs on him are so cool too like they they are like so simple and and crude looking because that's how Ginkgo explains them is like the most primal form of life. Yeah. Or even before life. He yeah. does that body analogy where it's just like, let's say the middle finger of your hand is humanity. You just trace that all the way down past pants, uh, plants and fungus to your heart. And that's what the Mushi are. Mushi? That's right. I suppose there's really no simple way to explain what they are. But let me give you an analogy. Say these four fingers represent animal life and your thumb represents plant life. Human beings would be here, at the tip of your middle finger, the farthest point from your heart. Moving toward the palm of your hand, you find the lower forms of animal life. When you get to your wrist, though, that's where your blood vessels combine into one, right? Right. This is where you would find fungi and microorganisms. From here, it becomes more and more difficult to distinguish between plant and animal life. Even so, there is still life beyond this point. And if you keep going... All the way up your arm, past your shoulder, when you get to this point, at the place that's closest to your heart, right here, these creatures are the Mushi. You know what Mushi always remind me of is, do either of you have floaters in your eyes? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So oh if, you like, if you look up at like a blue sky and you just see like little specks and little strings moving around in your vision, mm. that's all. that always reminds me of what Mushi are mm. kind of like, just these... Barely there, sort of strange little shapes that exist. Uh, Man, now, now, I need, the next time I see a floater, I'm just going to think it's a mushi. Yeah, now, now I'm super aware of them because I'm staring at a white wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at them right now. Yeah, <laughs> we're surrounded by mushi. Uh, yeah. uh, now that that analogy of the finger to the heart is like so perfect. Mm-hmm. Like they mean to, you know, n- most people probably haven't heard of mushi in like the. Uh, mythological sense in their lives so it's just such an easy explanation just like well everybody's 
probably got a middle finger that they can, and then think about the arteries in their hands. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in comparison to like fungi and like that's okay, fungi and that's like the gray area. But past that, mm. that's where the weird shit is. In so your heart, far. <laughs> that's those. That's mushy. And it's a good way to show that everything is connected too. They're not like mm. existing separate from the system. They're part of it, but lots of people can't see them. Most people can't. Right. Right. Yeah. And then in their dialogue in this scene, there's so many just like pauses. They just like. They really just wait and take their time. I, I I love the gradualness of it. Like I watch I watch so many shows. Like uh, like the main anime I watch every week is My Hero. Now mm-hmm. it's just the it's the easy mainstream one to watch. But I also really like it. Like but sure. that one is at you know typical like super speed or just like it. It's always keeping you engaged with all the stuff like. And bright colors everywhere. And then to, to go from that to this in the same week of watching stuff, <laughs> it, it is a real, like, mood change. Some yeah. people really don't like it. Uh, they don't like that vibe. and Because I, I, they think it's boring or it's too slow or whatever. Um, and I can understand where they're coming from. But for me, it's just, that's one of the selling points. Uh, I'm always, like, this may be unfair to say, but if someone's like, Oh, why, why was it boring? It was slow. That's only why you don't <laughs> you think it was boring. I don't know. They should articulate themselves more. I I think you need to be in the mood for it. I mean, uh, I watched oh, it this morning sure. with coffee. Uh, overcast day was the perfect mushishi setting oh, yeah. for this. So. Yeah, 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 and we've got like uh, trees outside, so we got a lot of green around us right now in our in our Airbnb. It's definitely not go. Oh man, you want to watch some fucking anime, y'all? Let's get hyped, <laughs> Mushishi. It's not that kind of show. Slam the VHS in. <laughs> yeah, get ready for action. Yeah. But it's it's an easy way to come down. I do like like I like the relaxed mood watching these like three episodes put me in. I I also noticed at least in the first three. Um, Ginko really he he helps kids a lot, and so mm-hmm. like in in the first three at least, it's all like kids who are cut off from society in one way or the other, and he kind of in his way helps re-socialize them. Just yeah. to remind me, one of them's the blind girl, right? The blind girl, and yeah. The other, and then the, uh, the, the four horn, tender horns, it's called the the boy with the horns oh, on yeah. his head. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know if that is consistent, but I could. I can see in a, uh, you know, when you want to introduce your hero and show him he's a good guy, helping kids is is an easy uh, go-to mm. as well, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I was originally, when I pitched Mushishi, um, well, I, I hadn't, I, when you said you hadn't watched it, I was like, no, we got to start with the first one. Mm-hmm. But there was a different episode I was going to like have us watch maybe instead, um, where it's a, it's one of my favorite ones where the whole, the Mushi in that episode is a rainbow but the rainbow just appears anywhere. And, oh. it's, and it's them trying to find this. And it's like a very like kind of funny like episode, but it's also kind of sad because hmm. um, like this guy, well, and I'm just going through an entire <laughs> episode description, but basically <laughs> it's, what on the, it's just, it's an easy sell. Like, oh man, look at that. This rainbow is like living and it like twists around a tree and it's, we're trying to find the end of this rainbow. Um, but I'm glad we ended up doing this one because this one sets up a lot of it sets up koki like you know the river of light um it sets up what mushi are um and it sets i think the a good tone for the rest of the show and because then it can play with it a bit like not every episode is just super quiet mm. only like subdued like easy res- not easy but like calm peaceful resolution some episodes get real fucked mm. and some episodes get really like you know like uh, what I really like about Ginko as a protagonist is that, um, for the most part, like ninety percent of the time, he, it's definitely like, yeah, I've seen this shit before. Mm. But, yeah. but in if there is a situation where Ginko is actually like scared or like a little like he doesn't go full on, but you feel that like, oh shit, like if Ginko is like mm. this shit's fucked, then this shit is fucked uh, for real. Mm. Um, but I'm glad that we went with this episode with this episode because it sets everything up really nicely. I mean, it is the first episode, obviously, mm. but even just the atmosphere and the tone, I think, is a good starting point for what the rest of the show is like. Mm-hmm. And at this point in the story, it basically becomes almost a ghost story, but that shows mm. off his expertise because he is here for this ghost. Like, he even knows her name, so he's up 
uh, trying to find the bathroom at night. Maybe that's just his excuse to look for this ghost. But he sees this ghostly figure at the end of the hallway, and he takes out, well, we don't know what it is. It's later revealed to be a, a mushy needle. Mm. It's like a telescoping needle. He doesn't actually use it, but it's implied that he can use it to get like a trace of the mushy or to study the mushy or something like that. It might come up in later episodes. Yeah, it comes up later. Yeah. Um, I think maybe it, there's a bit of a misunderstanding. I don't think he actually knows about Renzu at all. Oh, really? I think he goes to that house because he hears the rumor. And he's like, oh, there's a kid who can like make things alive. Probably a mushy. Let's go take a look. Um, I think he, once he like sees her, like he's like, oh, there's a, because there's, the, when he was walking through, he's like, oh, there, there might be mushy in this house probably. Mm. And wouldn't be that surprised. And then it's, um, when, once she appears and then he, um, he, sa- uh, he says something like, oh, he sees the cup. And then yeah. he's like, oh, I know who you are. I know exactly who you are, and I know what I can figure out what I was just confused here. as to how he knew her name. Uh, I think um, Shinra had mentioned. The he okay. told the story of the grandma. Didn't so say the name. That, yeah. but, but Because the line was like, I've done, I know who you are. I've done my homework, basically, is what he says. I, I think that's because he, like, before coming to Shinra's house, he did, like, study, like, okay. who he was and that kind of thing. Um that's what I understand, anyway. But I do like how a matter of fact he is about dealing with uh, what anyone would be uh, freaked out by. Oh yeah, or, like so he pulls out this needle, and then when he's confronted by this uh, this ghostly girl, he uses his cigarette to basically wrap her in the smoke and bring her down to the ground because apparently he has like smokable mushi. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can smoke it. That's he's good that, shit. Yeah, that good mushi. The dank mushi <laughs> nugs. Uh, I really like that scene because the, like you said, it's such an introduction to the world of it. And you, you know, if you're, if you're reading this and coming into it, just like, well, I know a typical ghost manga is or whatever. The way that Renzu first appears, it's this floating girl who says, you lowly mushishi, you, Mm. you shouldn't be here. Like you think giant fights about to happen right. or like everything's about to go down and, and instead Ginko just goes like, Oh lolly, huh? Eh. And he just like ties her up and like, okay, it's it's cool. Right. Everything's all right. Say, what do we have here? A broken wine cup. It's a shame. I really like the color. Shut up. Give it back. How dare you barge into my house like this? Go away! Get out! That's big talk coming from a mushi. What are you saying? This is your house? Yes, that's right. Ah, I see. I think I'm beginning to understand. You were a human once, but somehow you came to acquire Mushi characteristics. You're rather weak, though, which suggests you're not a full Mushi. And along with the broken green wine cup, gives me some idea of how you ended up like this. It also tells me who you are. Your name... is Renzu. You didn't think I'd come all this way without doing my homework, did you? I think I know a way that we can make this wine cup whole again. Care to hear me out? For your grandson's sake. Yeah, in any other anime, it'd be like, I gotta take out my secret cigarette. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Smoke technique! And then, like, no, he's just like, all right, puff, puff. Yeah, we're good. So yeah. he's not an exterminator like Dale Gribble, but he's an effective smoker like oh, Dale yeah. Gribble. So he, one thing in common with yeah. him. I want to see a whole PowerPoint uh, <laughs> of the similarities between Kingo and Dale, Dale Gribble hides both eyes. He hides one eye. So we got to uh, throw that one out. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, right. Uh, but full head of hair on Ginko. Which yes. Is, Do we know it's a wig? Is that the final episode? <laughs> <laughs> it's knocked off. Uh, but yeah, the, their encounter it really is another great like tone setter for this and shows you the rules. And same with just like, um, yeah, if you were watching a regular action show about the guy who comes to town, who's clearly your protagonist, and you think, you know, other other first chapters would have shown, well, this is how badass your character is because he kills this person or he he easily disposes of the first person he meets but instead you get to see like more of his like de-escalation abilities and his Mm. uh his friendly nature more so he's a negotiator too yeah Yeah, you're right it is way cooler to just watch him just go puff a cigarette done 
<laughs> it's so easy to him. Yeah. Yeah, and also how nice he is of saying just like, oh, it dissipates really fast. Like yeah. you're not you're not like trapped in this forever. It's not yeah. going to kill you. Like, and this is when uh, it's revealed to the viewer that this is uh, Shinra's grandmother. He's mm. like, do you want to help me out for your grandmother's sake? And what I like about Ginko is that even when he's not the narrator, he is still the narrator. Mm. Uh, in this episode, he's like, well, here's what happened. I'm talking to Shinra. Here's what happened to your grandma. And he narrates for Shinra like that she was part of the ceremony with the Mushi. Um, when you drink of their uh, wine, you are you become a Mushi, but the mm. ceremony was interrupted somehow, and that's why part of her is stuck in the Mushi world, but part of her uh, left that and was a part of the real world when you knew her, basically. Sure. Now the uh, also with the name Shinra, it did make me think of uh, every F- time. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. time I wrote it down. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, also like uh, Shinra was trying. It it well, it did have interactions with like the spirits of the earth and everything, right? Like they, uh, yes, yes, well, the light, the life stream, the life stream is, all that stuff. That sounds like Koki oh, shit, by it's another all, name. It's all the same. Yeah. It's all connected. Man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, also, like, s- former Square people tried to make the company Shinra. I will say, don't name your uh, company mm. Evil Incorporated <laughs> <laughs> based on uh, what we know about Final Fantasy VII. Uh, but, it didn't work out. <laughs> I, I like to, um, you know, Renzu, the ghost, goes so quickly from threatening that when she's humbled, she's just like, you see that it was kind of just a front she was putting on to try to scare him away. Right, Yeah, right. I liked uh, the, the g- good acting on her part, too, of just how she... This fully changes the second uh, this their positions are swapped there. And they introduce some rules here where so uh, Ginko can see um, Renzu, but uh, Shinra can't because she's only half Mushi. But apparently Ginko can see any kind of Mushi, even mm. if you're only half Mushi. Right. Yeah. And I, I also really like when he's telling the story of how they somehow got, you know, we don't see the full story until later. But when he explains it, like you only knew half your grandmother, the shot. The just the picture of the shadow staying behind and the mm. foot stepping forward. That's like such a just like stirring image. So of good. It. Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, it I don't know, it, it kind of calls back like the idea of like uh, your lost childhood or like some sure. some part of you stayed behind when you grew up, like that kind of thing. It's uh yeah, I, I just love the imagery in that. Yeah. So at this point in the story, Ginko wants Shinra to help her, um, his grandmother enter the Mushi world fully by helping her complete the ceremony with his power to bring things to life through <laughs> his uh, hand. Oh, yeah. When he explains the ceremony, and I saw this in a few others, like he has a, in the other two, he has a moment where he explains like, well, this type of Mushi does this to somebody. It did remind me a little of that uh, classic viral tweet about Mulder explaining a knife alien. <laughs> yeah. It's like, have you heard of a knife alien? Have like, you heard of the wine Mushi? Yeah, have you heard exactly. of the drunk Mushi? Yeah. You just go around drinking shit. It's like, you're making this up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, Shinra is like, okay, I'm getting behind the screen. Don't look at what I'm doing. So like I said, uh, Ginko is a Mushi nerd. So I like was like, well, you told me not to look, so I have to look. I so he pokes look, a hole yeah. through the screen. Mm-hmm. And then when uh, Shinra actually recreates the wine cup, uh, he just jumps over the screen to check it out. It's like, I got to see this. Like, I am I'm a nerd. This is my job. This is my uh, interest. So I have to find out what's going on. Right. Yeah, it's a great little character moment for him that he sees like, well, he said he wouldn't watch. But, man, he's got it. I mean, this is magic right here in front of me. I got to see this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but he's he's still so friendly about it too. Like even his and his excitement when it all comes together, he's like bingo! Like he just jumps up over it. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as he creates the recreates this wine cup, it cracks in half, and that's when he asks Renzu to give him the other half. So uh, Shinra can't see Renzu, so basically nothing throws the other half of the cup at Ginko, and he joins the two together, and that's when it fills with that uh, life wine we find out about. Mm-hmm. And when Renzu comes alive uh, and is is a, a visual, I like that uh, Shinra's reaction was like, "Oh, I thought I was going to see an old lady." Yeah, like, it's like, yeah. "Oh, it's like an <laughs> eight year old girl." Yeah. That's the other uh, like the other tiny bit of comedy in this episode, like the uh, the not overreaction, but a little bit exaggerated reaction of him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, from him. Yeah, they don't follow that too far. Show, yeah, like, just yeah. cut that off there. They don't have him uh, collapse on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> My grandma's cute. Yeah. Oh God, uh, they didn't. They didn't take no, it there. They didn't. No. no. Uh, So, yeah, when uh, Shinra starts to drink this wine in the reflection, he sees the flashback of how what actually took place at this ceremony. I like how friendly Ginko is in offering up the sake, too. He's just like, no, it's celebratory. Just hey, here, have a drink. Sure, sure. Yeah. And he's not doing it to, like, trick him. But he is, I mean, in a way, it is celebratory, I guess. 
Uh, maybe he could have said entirely, this will cause a flashback if you drink this. But mm. It's flashback it, juice. Yeah. <laughs> but they, but they showed, flashback. But also, I guess it was good they showed earlier that Shinra just drinks all the time because... It He's would, like, fuck yeah, yeah, give me that Cokie. <laughs> Throw it back. <laughs> What's the chaser? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it would be weird to see an adult man offering uh, alcohol to a, uh, to a kid. There's a lot yeah. of kid a, a kid drinking in this episode. <laughs> yeah. He gets hung over. In the, like, yeah. Events. yeah. Jeez. He's seen some shit this Shinra, so I, 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 it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but in this flashback, we see that uh, this was Renzu's plan all along. Like she had, she wanted to find this ceremony and make it to it before sunset. Like she had a goal for this to happen to her. And uh, we see the ceremony take place with the Mushi as they pass this cup around and they hand the cup to her and she starts drinking from it. At this point, they describe what the wine is. It's from this river of light that mm-hmm. exists all around us and the cup can filter it. And that's why the cup fills on its own. Mm-hmm. I've never tasted anything like it. I could lose myself in this forever. Are you enjoying your drink? What you are tasting is a living entity known as Light Wine. It springs from a place that normally you could not reach. A river of light that flows in the depths of the deepest darkness. We have created especially for you this wine cup, which can extract the light. The river flows all around you, as it has since my first began. When it nears the soil, grasses grow green and forests blossom. If it recedes, the landscape withers in drought. In other words, it is the water of life. You will not taste anything more delicious in this world. The reason we have set this banquet for you and shared with you this drink is that we have a favor to ask of you. Thirty-one years from now, your grandson will be born with a very special gift. A power with the potential to change the world as you know it. We would like you to watch over him for the entirety of his life. My... my grandson. His powers will be a source of great happiness for both him and the world. If you agree to the task we have set before you, we will grant you powers of your own. Drink the wine to the last drop, and it will be so. Yeah, I know. And in the second episode, the River of Light is used to great effect for oh, a yeah. uh, story. And you get uh, in that one, you do get a like a little hint of Ginkgo's past too, which mm. I, I really like learning. It, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm gonna watch more of. I oh, did, please do. Yeah. I I did say this about Chi Hai Fru, and I <laughs> haven't watched more of it since we last recorded. I I will, but. This one, especially with its availability on YouTube, it's just so easy. I feel like it's, I, I'm at least going to watch a couple on the plane on the way back. That's for sure. I'm glad to hear it. There's a shot in that scene that's like mentioning when I was mentioning before, just like little splashes of horror where uh, the crow like bite, tears off the foot of mm. the of the mushi and it's like made of like worms or whatever. Just a little horror shot there to end the ceremony and I love that. Yeah. A bird ruined all this fun. <laughs> yeah. So we <laughs> just recorded bird. a pro bird show. Now we're on anti bird shows. <laughs> but yeah, also like mushi in uh, Japanese means bug as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I assume like the kanji are different for the spiritual mushi and the bug mushi or something's going on there. But mm-hmm. they are like little bugs, right? Yeah. So they're yeah. like made of little bugs, the people yeah, I like that they all took they took on human appearance to talk, but they it it all the second a crow attacks them, it all just falls apart and they're gone. Like, yeah. Also, love the design of the little mushi that lead her there. Yeah, the little, yeah. Little, the little how do you even describe them? Like little leggy guys, yeah, like, yeah. spiraling around. Reminds me of like a little Ghibli creation or something. Yeah, Super Ghibli. Oh yeah, I definitely got feels of the. Um, bobblehead guys from Mononoke mm. like there's 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 a bit of Mononoke feels in this series I mean they're both dealing with the same kind of like primal um, magic kind of thing yeah. that's yes, gonna be yeah. my normie pitch for this it's like spooky <laughs> Ghibli <laughs> Oh, yeah. a spooky Ghibli movie. What oh, if Mononoke TV. was a TV show? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you, if you said Ghibli, you can be like, like, see, now it's not like it's it's good anime like Ghibli. You don't <laughs> have to look down on it. Like, <laughs> right. You know, that's uh, that's hard. I it's it's with friends. It's getting them past the point of watching a thing that isn't from Ghibli and be like, no, but it's still good anime. I think you'll like it. But, um, I was having an interesting conversation with a friend about anime, like people who grew up with anime. And you're used to like this is kind of going off topic, but uh, like you're so used to just let's say boobs in your face mm-hmm. or something like that, just like ridiculous kind of gross tropes. Where if you show, if you try to show a show to a friend who didn't grow up with anime, they're like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> like, like oh, those are the these boobs. are high schoolers, and I'm like, "No, uh, 
Yeah, but <laughs> no, it's fuck. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing. I can't defend it. It's mm. that's uh, yeah. You've been worn down by the tropes long enough where they yeah. don't even right. affect You're you like, anymore. I'm like, oh yeah, that's the the high school teacher pulls out her titties. Yeah, obviously <laughs> that's a thing, right? Oh no, that's not. That's weird. Yeah, it is for you weird. it's like oh this scene again. For a friend it's like what's you, happening? This is vile. Mm. Uh, but then, am I being arrested? <laughs> <laughs> but then with Mushishi it's great because it doesn't have that. Yeah. Mushishi is very like. Uh, What's the word? Not safe, but like just no uh, obnoxious shit. I think mm-hmm. that's the best way to put it. It's just it's good storytelling. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. feels mature. <laughs> I yeah, I think with the TNA and anime for us who grew up with it, it is like uh, in. Itchy and Scratchy Land with Bard and Lisa just like saying how desensitized they are to the violence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it, I, it that also goes for like violence in anime too. I sure. think, but yeah, I it, it's weird if I watched uh, like Western produced animation that had as much TNA as I see in a show like. Uh, even my even my hero even my has hero? it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, uh, like I would the like <laughs> like when I was watching them one of the most recent episodes where they just introduced this guy's secretary and she just has like eighty percent under boob in her costume and I'm like. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's, it's a show. It's just how it I mean, is. Like, oh. it helps that this is made uh, for adults. It's not like the sort of uh, adults only, not for kids. This sure. is like made for adults. And uh, my hero, as good as it is, is made for young boys, mm-hmm. young horny boys. Yeah, yes, that's true. And made by a young horny boy. <laughs> but, but at least on that show, they tell you that Grapehead is bad, and you shouldn't be mm. like Grapehead. I think that's usually the joke with Grapehead. Uh, Grapehead. But back yeah. to uh, Mushishi. Anyway, yes. anyway, back to the opposite of Grapehead, which yes. is Mushishi. Uh, but the reason why they chose Renzu, the Mushi, uh, chose her because they said, you know, in 31 years, you'll have a grandson with a special gift and we want you to watch over him. And in return, we will grant you a gift too. Mm. But unfortunately, it's cut off right there with bird violence. Yeah. <laughs> a bird shows up and ruins everything. Yeah, that, uh, that's a pretty crazy prophecy they throw out there too. It's like... like uh, well, also as a child to hear like, oh, well, your grandson's going to do this. You're like, well, what? Like, yeah. that's that's a great reaction on on Renzu there to hearing that news. But does does this prophecy ever come back in the show of what Shinra? Uh, I would think they don't revisit him. They do but, not. Okay. It, this one is like an interesting one because uh, I remember even when I was when I one time I rewatched it and I was like, it's weird because in the first episode the Mushi feel very like um, sentient. Like, mm. they feel very, we are be- beings with brains, but none of the other episodes really feel like that. In, mm. in most of the episodes, the Mushi feel just like a, like a force of nature. So, uh, I mean, sometimes they'll, like, uh, material, I guess that's not necessarily true, because you'll definitely have ones where the Mushi, even in this one, like, the she becomes kind of half Mushi, but there are Mushi mm. that act human. Um, but the whole idea of, like, a prophecy, this one was... Interesting, mm. and I'm wondering if it's because it's like one of the first ones, and it wasn't nearly as established. They don't really play a lot with like prophesizing in this show. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe that was like an editor note of like a tease that things could happen in the future. Yeah, maybe. Bring up this prophecy. Yeah, but, but you know what, Mushi, yeah, they're all so fucking crazy and weird, and mm. you know, it, you don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe there can be Mushi that can see the future. You know, you don't. You never know. It's I like fun. that it started raining during this conversation. It's really setting the tone the, here. And then, oh, we're gonna, yeah, and I can still <laughs> see the floaters. And yeah. <laughs> it's it's a haunted uh, recording. But yeah, in this one, they seem like uh, sentient, like they are watchers of humanity but i guess in the future they're more like just a part of the world just they definitely feel more like that yeah i think for most of the show okay yeah i guess i guess uh, earlier uh ginkgo says like they can they can take human form sometimes sure. it's not like an all the time thing for them right but i do like how uh, we see a nice little effective scene of basically the uh the mushy form of renzu walking out of her human body and we hear the cup sever but we don't see it and i'm like mm. they had to think of like what does a cup severing sound <laughs> like and then <laughs> put that in the show mm. so it's very effective i'm like oh that's the sound of a cup severing yeah and yeah then just have that in the stock library for <laughs> whenever we need that again and the the shot of uh, Renzu like watching herself walk away from her like that is that is like a disturbing kind mm. of shot too. I really like that. Yeah, this is when Renzu fully appears before Shinra, and Shinra just uh, is so overwhelmed with emotion from learning about this story that he's crying, and uh, the tears turn into the life wine essentially and uh, spread all over the ground. And later we see that moss has grown there because of the life wine. Mm. Mm-hmm. Shinra. 
sorry. I'm crying, but I have no idea why. Shimmer's tears would not stop. He could feel all of Renzu's emotions as her memories flowed through him. He experienced that day in the forest, just as she had. And finally, he understood. The overwhelming sadness. The profound sense of loss over the broken cup. And as Shinra's tears flowed, so did the light wine. It flowed from the cup, endlessly. Like the river from which it came. Yeah, it's really... Or sorry, light wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Low yeah. calorie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, like a sea... It's like a Seagram's. Yeah. The, but yeah, it, uh, the moss everywhere too, like it, it adds more green. Like there's just the, you know, green in the title of this. There's just green everywhere. Green at the beginning the where he's like, it's this area is, you know, very green. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. And it's like, I think it's very symbolic of him having solved the problem and he spreads life behind him where it's like... Now the problem is solved. It's sort of like uh, playing Okami, where you bring the yeah, world yeah. to life after you solve all the evil problems. <laughs> and it just ties back to him just going, you know, Mushi is, they're just living things. That's all it is. And, you know, they do weird shit. But uh, at the like at the end of the day, they are just a living thing like you and I are. And it, it just has a nice little... A nice little period to the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, and, and his way of solving the problem with Renzu is the opposite of an exterminator, too. He's like, oh, I'm going to make her fully mushy instead of, like, the That's half true, yeah. she's left as. Yeah, yeah, and, like, that he's... All the tears crying, too. Like, I love I love when anime cries. Like, it's mm. just always... Especially when they're these, like, you Viscous know, anime tears. Yes, these mm. powerful, just, like... Some One yeah. Piece tears. Oh. Yeah, you're crying out of your nose, your oh, mouth, your ears, beautiful. your eyes. Just, like, waterfalls. Those are the that's ultimate tears. That's how you tears. cry. Yeah. When you cry... Or at least, I mean, if you cry, like, real, real hard, that's... You don't look like a mess. One mm-hmm. Piece right. does make snot emotional. Yes. <laughs> Not non-comical snot. But, yeah, so this episode ends. We do see... Uh, Ginko leaves uh, Shinra while he's sleeping. We see that, like, he's not interested in making connections. He is a traveler. Mm. He's got to move on with his life. But at this point, he is stopped by Renzu and asked her to come back and visit again. Mm. But uh, he's basically like, no, that's your job now. Your job is to watch over him. That's mm. what the Mushi told you to do. Uh, it's interesting. There is a, a in-universe explanation. Uh, I don't know if it, they got to it when, in the three episodes you watched. But uh, there's actually true. a reason why he has to keep walking. Oh really? Which okay. Is, it's really interesting. Um, mm-hmm. And the uh, I also really love that at the end he took the green cup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, oh no, this is mine. He's like, like mm-hmm. I'll just borrow that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the horns one, he keeps the horns too. Yeah, like, yeah. I, and that's another. There's another. It, it, like going back to how the show it is episodic, but there are payoffs. Like mm-hmm. you're, you will see later. Oh, why is he? Taking these things. Well, I, uh, just as like an outline of a character, like, you know how they say uh, a great character, you can tell them by their silhouette. Like, mm. I really like that Ginko's silhouette, like, includes like this big, like, basically chest of drawers he walks around yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. It's just this rectangular box on his back. Pretty much he's... like Death Stranding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been playing that lately. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's he's learned. He doesn't seem to have much trouble with the encumbrances on that. But, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I also, yeah, Shinra is just like hung over. Over the next day, he's like, "Why you laugh? What? <laughs> uh, too much, too much light wine." But yeah, yeah so the episode just kind of uh, has a very low key ending, and there's some narration from Ginko saying um, these rumors disappeared. The rumors about uh, Shinra, so he'll be safe, and it sort of establishes they're back to the status quo, like the peaceful status quo that is established by like now there's life there. The problem is gone. Shinra is still anonymous. Is will be anonymous to the world, but he'll be with his grandmother. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, uh, he, life with your grandmother. <laughs> yeah. Just your grandmother who's younger than you. Yeah. Yeah. Not weird at all. But yeah. uh, let's move on from that world. <laughs> well, yeah. And Ginko just travels on like like you said, like the Incredible Hulk to the the next town he's going to, and uh, I. Unless they cut it out for the YouTube version, they, there's no eye catch on the show either, is there? No, like, there's uh, no yeah. eye catch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And even the ending, it just kind of slow fade to yeah, black and then fade that. back in. Yeah, like, and it yeah. just it's, and there's just like beautiful soft music at the end. Oh man, yeah, what just a fucking the, good show. Just slow piano music <laughs> over foliage. I will like, say, watch yeah. it in the morning. Don't watch it before bed. It's a good, it's a good having oh, a, yeah. a coffee show. Like have a coffee <laughs> and then a scone and watch the show at nine in the morning. Now I want a, like a mushishi like Azumanga die like da 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 da. You ever watch that? Oh, yeah. oh, I, I catch yeah. just <laughs> some shrill woodwinds swinging you up. <laughs> 
<laughs> it would be, be him like dancing with uh, a mushi somewhere. Yeah, there's no kazoos in this at all. Uh, <laughs> I graded an F. But uh, yeah, that's our Mushishi podcast. Uh, thank you, Sungwon, for joining us. You of came course. all the way out to our Airbnb, and I'm sure you'll be back for more uh, obscure anime chats. I have a whole list of anime. Every time I'm on, uh, as long as you guys are will allow it, I will pitch a new anime to make you guys watch. Oh, for sure. Because uh, there's so many good hidden... Not hidden, but like, you know, it's, you know, you, you were like, we could do My Hero. And I was like, we could do My Hero. Mm. Or <laughs> <laughs> we could do Mushishi because no one's going to talk about Mushishi. People were excited when we put that on the schedule. Oh, so, that's yeah. great. Uh, so before we ask you what you're doing now, uh, since the show is going to be a little shorter than normal, can you talk about like any anime recommendations you might have for new stuff? Mm. Uh, new stuff? Yeah, anything lately you've been watching. I'm curious too. I'm always behind. So I'm way behind. <laughs> like I'm, I'm all, like I'm actually really behind. So I don't really have anything new. The, the next show I need to watch when I finish is just Chihaya for season three. Is that because oh, you've been yeah. playing too much Fire Emblem? I've been reading your tweets oh, about it. I've been playing a lot of Fire Emblem and I've been playing a lot of Pokemon. Lately. Okay. So, what, is, yeah. what was your hour count on Fire Emblem? Oh God. Uh, I played it four times, and so wow. And wow. So that, and I'm working on a fifth. I, uh, I had 80 hours on just one playthrough. I, I couldn't... I was like, I can't do another house. I got to move on to other games. Yeah, it's, it's like, I think maybe 200 some 200, wow. 300 hours. Wow. It was uh, nice of them to put all three games in one game instead of selling them separately, like on the 3DS. Yes, <laughs> yes it yeah. was really nice. And... The game is fucking great. I don't know. Did you, did you enjoy oh, it? Oh, I loved it. I, I would say I, uh, whenever you have time, the other houses are actually really worth playing. Uh, yeah, I, uh, man, but the yellow house is so cool. Oh, the deers, okay. The you did yellow house? Favorite. Yeah, yeah. It is like the best ending. Yeah, I. Uh, the only downside, well, I did... I didn't spoil anything for myself other than gay options, and I was like, mm. okay, what's the only dude I can romance? Mm. Eh, he doesn't didn't do anything for me when I first met him, so I was like, all right, I'll play as a girl and get with Raphael. Like that was my pick, oh, like okay. Raphael. Yeah. I, uh, but yeah, the I love it. I've I've played every released in English Fire Emblem game. I've beaten them all. Oh shit! So, so you go hard. Yeah, but I but I lo- oh I mean I played in the not fun way of restarting every death. Uh, but, I'm glad uh, they ended that. <laughs> yeah, uh, because you, I guess you can still play that way, but yes, you shouldn't. You can and I will. You won't stop. <laughs> oh, you still I, do. Damn, I did too. Wow, yeah. wow. Uh, but. But I I always loved Fire Emblem, but I just saw it as this not popular series. It was like, yeah, it'll never be popular, at least here. And then when they made it an anime dating game, too, I was like, I never thought I could love you more, Fire mm-hmm. Emblem. And then you did this, and now, yeah, the then all the school stuff and the day-to-day like personification it's of it, too. It's so yeah. good. And by the way, this is not off topic because Fire Emblem is basically anime. It is absolutely it's anime yeah. chess, is what it is. <laughs> exactly. Now I will say uh, an anime that I re am rewatching now uh, is Shirobako, which maybe yeah. that, maybe next time that was a potential yeah. choice for this time. I think you brought it up. As I was, one but of I was the like, but I was like, we have to watch three mm. because it wraps. So I like I was watching it uh, and I was like, wow, the first three episodes are like a perfect package of like it 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 has this conflict and then it resolves. And it's great. So, all right, that'll may, be our next. one. Maybe yeah. next one yeah. if we if you guys have time, we should do Shirobako. Yeah, during a less busy time, I, next trip I think we'll be able to do it. Okay. So yes, but uh, Sungwon, please tell us what you're working oh, on now. Gosh, voice yeah. acting, uh, fun YouTube stuff. What's going on with you? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm doing voice acting. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, I can talk. Anything that's recent, I. Uh, speaking of Legend of the Galactic Heroes, I'm in the the reboot. Oh, I cool! Joined, awesome. Uh, I I voice Lagrange. Uh, he's a <laughs> he's a vice admiral, uh, and he's in that the re the new 2019 Legend of the Galactic Heroes, which is really cool. Um, otherwise, uh, I don't know. Borderlands Three, the DLC. I I voice Flack in that. That's out. Oh, cool. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and then you can check me out on. Twitter, YouTube, just prozd, p r o z d. Yeah, your uh, one of my your recent comedy video. I didn't even need to know it was like titled Fire Emblem or whatever. The second you did the voiceover of like the 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 happy children celebrating oh, murder, I yeah. was like, yeah, this is Fire. Emblem. This is Fire Emblem. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, also, uh, I don't watch a lot of non podcast things because I spend about a week a month in Canada to see my uh, girlfriend, mm. and we have started watching uh, Terrace House, and she showed me your <sighs> video after yeah. we saw a few of them. Like that's it. That's it. It's like occasionally they eat. It's <laughs> the best. Are you enjoying it? I am. I, I didn't. 
think I would. So fucking good. Yeah. I love Terrace House. There won't be a what a Terrace House. There's too many episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and how many things can you say mm. exactly? Oh, yeah. I'm sure there are podcasts for it. But... Oh, oh, I mean, we couldn't do one, but I'm sure there are like five podcasts. I'm, I'm sure there are, yeah. <laughs> uh, so thanks for joining us. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, next time I'll be back with another anime to make you guys watch. So look forward to that. Thank cool. you. So we're doing this wrap up. We're back at Henry Gilbert's apartment. So we want to say thank you to Sung One Show for being on the podcast. So much great stuff he's part of. Please check him out on Twitter. He is ProZD on Twitter and you'll be able to find out all everything he's doing from voice acting to YouTube videos and so on. He's a busy guy and we're happy he made time for us to be on our podcast and mm-hmm. he'll be back in the future. So oh, yeah. please wait for our next LA trip. We'll get him again. <laughs> yes. Thanks so much to Sung One Show. It's been awesome to chat with him. He's uh, such a cool guy. It's like he came off of my TV to hang out with me. <laughs> Does he like us? <laughs> we'll find out in the next podcast when we confront him. <laughs> yes, he'll be like, we'll hand him a note that says, "Did you? do you like me? <laughs> and we'll tell the listeners which box he checks. Uh, but as for us, if you want to support our show and get every podcast one week ahead of time and ad free, you got to go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons and sign up at the $5 level for $5 a month, a very low price. You'll get just that and also access to everything we've done on the Patreon behind that paywall for the past two and a half years. That is over 100 bonus podcasts, including all of our limited miniseries, the most recent of which just wrapped up. It is Talking Futurama Season 2 Part 1, the first 10 episodes of Futurama with the Talking Simpsons treatment. You know you love it. Again, there is way too much stuff happening at the $5 level to go into right here, but Henry will tell you what's going on at the $10 level at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons, an extra long podcast every month for patrons that's decided by patrons. Henry, what is that? That is the What a Cartoon Movie podcast, only for our most premium of members. At the $10 level, you get all of that $5 stuff, and you get to one exclusive podcast a month that the regular folks don't get. What a Cartoon Movie, where me and Bob talk about a different animated feature film once a month. Our most recent one, as we ended 2019, is The Iron Giant, the Brad Bird classic. We go deep into that film, that uh, cult cinema that uh, sadly was overlooked in 1999, but 20 years later is one of the most celebrated films of its era, animation or otherwise. So please, if you sign up, you'll get access to over 40 hours of exclusive podcasts only for $10 and up Patreon supporters. So sign up at 10 bucks today at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. So I've been one of your hosts on this podcast. Check me out on Twitter as Bob Servo. My other podcast, of course, is Retronauts. It's a classic gaming podcast. Every Monday and occasionally on Friday. Check us out at Retronauts.com or wherever you find your podcast. Henry, how about you? Hey, I'm Henry Gilbert, and you should follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. Anytime new stuff goes live for all of our podcasts or where we go to cool Los Angeles places and hang out with uh, awesome guests, I'm sure to tweet about it there. Also, speaking of Twitter accounts, you should follow the official Twitter feed of the Talking Simpsons Network at Talk Simpsons Pod. That's at Talk Simpsons Pod. Whenever there's new things going on in our world, you'll learn about it there. And it's uh, become a whole lot of fun since we did, did a big revamp on it this year. So please, at Talk Simpsons Pod, check it out. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next week for the Psycho Pass episode, Crime Coefficient. That's episode one. And we will see you then. That's it!